Ramirez explains what we're witnessing happening in New York. When the number of immortals dwindles, they will be pulled towards a faraway land. This is the time of the gathering, where they will do battle with each other until there is only one left. Hence, there can be only one. For that one remaining, they receive the prize. Ramirez is training McLeod so he has a chance of surviving that long, because as we've seen, not all of the immortals are nice people, and we don't want the winner of the game to be a real asshole. You might wonder how Ramirez knows that. It's not like they came with instruction manuals or anything. More than likely, this is tied into the quickening, which Ramirez demonstrates in another way by tapping into the power of a nearby stag. And not just the power, but the feeling of it. It's likely that with enough time and consideration, these truths reveal themselves, especially with the power each draws in when another's head is taken. But there appears to be a connection between the immortals and their reality. Ramirez's katana is flung away off a cliff, yet we soon see him with it, having recovered it without comment on needing to spend hours poking about the rocks trying to find it. Ramirez explains the downside of their situation, though, besides being hunted by an angry giant. They're sterile. Also, he may be immortal, but his loved ones won't be. Ramirez himself has had three wives in the 2,400 years that he's lived, the last one being a Japanese princess. I'd normally be skeptical because I've heard a lot of otakus who said the same thing, but in this case, Ramirez has the katana that her father made for him. His point is that watching your loved one age and perish is more than the heart can take, and so McLeod needs to leave Heather behind now while it's easier. Well, that's one thing he's not going to do. And what's the point of living without a chance for shagging? This is when the Black Knight is identified as the Kurgan, or rather, a Kurgan. The Kurgan people are associated with the Kurgan Hypothesis, which suggested that the Proto-Indo-European language and culture spread through migration and cultural assimilation by a people that originated in the steppes of Eastern Europe and Central Asia. The term Kurgan refers to their burial mounds. A pastoral people with mastery of horse riding and likely following warrior chieftains, it's believed their movements were a significant factor in the spreading of Bronze Age technology among the ancient peoples of Eurasia. Since it wasn't until the later part of the Bronze Age that they were able to make longer swords for slashing, swords were shorter and used for stabbing instead, the Kurgan likely spent his early years using an axe, which would be much better suited for removing a head than a bronze short sword. The Kurgan we're dealing with is a savage, and if he were to win the prize, it plunged the world into eternal darkness. No pressure. Later, when McLeod is away, Ramirez is having a fine meal with Heather when he senses the Kurgan approaching. The brute busts right through the door, but Ramirez slices his throat. Of course, that's not enough. You need to get the whole neck, so... All it does is alter the Kurgan's voice and pisses him off. Yeah, it's lucky for him he's immortal. He seems like he's a little careless. It looks like the presence of two powerful ancient immortals, both thousands of years old after all, is causing disruptions that are actually destroying the stone walls themselves. The Kurgan's all brute force. Ramirez has him outmatched in terms of skill, but because nothing short of a beheading is going to stop him, the Kurgan can just shrug off whatever damage he takes and just keep on coming. He impales Ramirez and, now that his foe is helpless, asks about Heather. Knowing that the Kurgan would use her against McLeod, Ramirez says that she's his woman, before the Kurgan finally decapitates Ramirez. Forces of the universe really don't want him savoring that win. In New York, McLeod finds Brenda in the lobby of the antique shop, his assistant, Rachel, trying to cover for him. Brenda is interested in the sword. The katana that McLeod used is dated to the 6th century BC, but it's folded 200 times. See, if you don't know, the creation of the katana requires an intricate process of folding the steel. You heat it, hammer it, fold it over on itself, and then hammer the steel again, repeating numerous times in order to refine the blade's structure. There's a bit of a misunderstanding about why that's good in this case, but not universally necessary. There's a common misconception that 
any sword that is folded is superior to any sword that is not. It comes down to the reason why the folding is being done in some cases, but not in others. In the case of the katana, it's being folded over because that process purifies the steel by removing impurities and evenly distributing the carbon content, which is essential for achieving a balance between hardness and flexibility in the blade. This folding process creates a distinctive grain pattern known as hada, enhancing the blade's aesthetic and physical strength. To compare to the previously discussed Toledo swords, forging those weapons didn't typically employ folding, yet it would be a misnomer to say they were inferior because they weren't folded the way that the katanas were. The reason why the katanas were being folded was because, frankly, their steel just wasn't that great. In Japan, the iron ore they were typically working with was magnetite. Now, the steel that they had, called tamahagane, was created from iron, sand, and charcoal. But even the best tamahagane had impurities in it. Now, these impurities were removed by the folding process. In addition, by hammering on it, you also took the carbon that wasn't evenly blended into the steel and helped distribute it throughout the entirety of the blade. It was necessary because their steel wasn't great quality. But Toledo, the focus was on starting with the highest quality steel there was, obtained from local iron ores that were already rich in carbon. Meticulous forging and tempering techniques then allowed the crafting of a finely balanced blade, optimized for both cutting power and resilience. The folding doesn't make the katana a superior blade, but the higher quality steel that the Toledo sword began with doesn't make it a higher quality one either. Both are pretty much identical and recognized as the highest quality blades in the world. The katana with its sharpness, strength, and flexibility. The Toledo sword with its durability, cutting power, and balance. One simply necessitated a different way of creating it than the other one did. But in the Japanese and European cultures respectively, these swords were renowned for both their functionality and their beauty, and were just as much symbols of honor as they were of power. Okay, nerd. I should add that while in Japan you are required to use tamahagane and the old techniques in order to create something and call it a katana, nevertheless, you're not going to be able to get a superior blade by folding modern steel and attempting this. At best, you would do nothing because the steel already has the impurities removed and the carbon properly distributed through the modern techniques that you use to manufacture it. At best, you do nothing. At worst, you'd actually make an inferior blade. It sounds very simple. Fold it over, hammer it down, repeat. It's not. It's a master craftsman who is capable of doing such a thing. And that's what has Brenda so interested. Someone having the skill to achieve this in the 6th century BC is someone operating on a whole different level than what they should have been technologically capable of. So yeah, of course, it's only natural that Brenda wants to see this thing and and Ramira is sure as hell had a good blade there. Everybody else was effectively using lutes, and he had an electric guitar. So, at his suggestion, they're going to have dinner at her place to discuss things. Well, the cops are watching Nash's antiques and spot Brenda going in, so that is going to come up. In the meantime, though, a flashback to World War II. McLeod finds himself in the middle of all that crazy and finds an orphan girl hiding, Rachel. Well, spotting a civilian carrying a child naturally convinces this Nazi to shoot him in the back. McLeod catches him off guard, seeing as how this guy didn't expect him to not be dead. Move. Nine. Erst musst du mich erschießen. <laughs> Whatever you say, Jack. You're the master race. Some people make things easy. And then there are Nazis who wear black and put skulls on their uniforms. Rachel notes that McLeod doesn't let himself love anyone, and yet he's going on this date tonight. Brenda's fully prepared. Tape recorder, loaded gun, everything his party needs. There's even that cop staking out her place tonight. After revealing he has a copy of her book, it shows that she was lying when she said she works for the Met, when in reality she works for police forensics. He also makes clear he spotted all her little things hidden around the apartment. Well, with a loaded gun, a hidden tape recorder, and a cop outside, he naturally leaps to the conclusion 
that they are trying to set him up for that murder. And he naturally is not going to do anything to help them, especially because he actually did kill that guy. I mean, even if he said the truth, even if he explained everything and proved to her on the spot that he is an immortal and that he didn't even start that fight, but once begun, it has to end with one of them losing their heads. And that's just the way this thing works. All the cops are going to hear is blah, 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 blah. I killed him, blah, blah, blah. I mean, when the lead detective on the case sees a cop in their own interrogation room try to punch a suspect and doesn't respond by throwing the cop out of the room, would you assume that you're going to get a fair shake? Yeah, there's nothing to suggest that she's the love interest and everything to say she's the one who is being used to try to get him to show her or talk about the murder weapon in the case he's being investigated for. Well... She's bothered because all she wants is to see the sword. She doesn't give a damn about this murder case. But there's this sexual tension there nevertheless, especially because he doesn't want to indulge it on account of the whole I'm going to live forever and you're just a mayfly next to me thing. This is clearly demonstrated in the big queen part of the film that follows, the song Who Wants to Live Forever? As we watch the life that McLeod shares with Heather, until the day it's clear the years have piled up and her body is succumbing to age, while he remains his youthful self. The end comes and he stays with her through good or ill, who loved him and built a home with him and, and I really think this is very important, never once suggested he be set on fire. With her death, MacLeod burns down his home, buries her, and leaves his broadsword to mark her grave. Makes sense. Without her, it's not a home. It's just a place to stay out of the rain and be reminded of what's gone. And There's plenty of places to stay out of the rain, and the sharp edges of absent love can only be dulled by allowing memories to fade. He still will keep his promise to always light a candle on her birthday, though, to have the comfort of remembering the good and giving up the loneliness that comes from absence. <laughs> 